this is this is a word that the Lord has put on my heart, and I'm so, I'm so excited. I've been praying most of the morning, God, please don't let me mess this up. This is a word that you've given me to give out to people. Please don't let me get in the way of it, but let me get in the flow of your spirit to give it the way you want people to hear it. Lord, thank you in Yeshua's name. This is the 4th of July. It's Independence Day. A lot of people just want to say July 4th. They don't want to talk about Independence Day and think about what they were talking. John was talking earlier and Augustine and others about what this day means. And that's what's on my heart today to talk about what this day means in America and what it should mean to the body of Messiah. So where do we start? Let's start like we usually do in the parasha, and we're going to look at, you know, we have a double parashiot. There are two portions this week, and, and Rabbi Philip had the John and Becky read from the uh, earlier parasha, the first one, but I'm going to read out of the second one, and this is from chapter 24 of Numbers, if you want to get your scriptures at home and follow along. This is Bamidbar, Numbers, chapter 24, and it says, when Balaam or Balaam in Texas, we call him Balaam. Everybody can say Balaam. We can pronounce Balaam. Balaam. When Balaam realized that it was pleasing in the eyes of Adonai to bless Israel, he did not resort to sorceries as at the other times because he had already blessed them a couple of times, but now he realizes God wants to bless and God's not going to curse. So he doesn't go to his sorcerer because this is not a Hebrew man or Hebrew prophet doing this. This is a foreigner. This is somebody who really wants to curse Israel, but he realizes if he curses Israel, God's going to drop him in his tracks. So he realizes God wants to bless Israel. It says he did not resort to sorceries as at the other times, but turned his face toward the wilderness. Lifting up his eyes, Balaam saw Israel dwelling by tribes. The Ruach Elohim came over him. The Spirit of God came over him. He uttered his oracle and said, this is the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the oracle of a strong man whose eye has been opened. The oracle of one hearing God's speech, one seeing Shaddai's vision, one fallen down yet with open eyes. And he begins to bless Israel with words that are used in, in Rosh Hashanah services and high holy day services. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, in your dwellings, O Israel. Like valleys they are spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by Adonai, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from his buckets, his seed by abundant water. His king will be greater than a god. His kingdom will be exalted. God is bringing him out of Egypt like the strong horns of a wild ox. He devours nations nations hostile to him. He will crush their bones. His arrows will pierce them. He crouches like a lion or a lioness who would rouse him. Who would rouse him? He who blesses you will be blessed and he who curses you will be cursed. And I want to leave that on our screen for just a minute. He repeats a blessing that God gave to Abraham years and years and hundreds of years before he repeats a, a blessing. Abraham, I'm going to bless you and your seed after you. And he who blesses you will be blessed and he who curses you will be cursed. And here the, one of the enemies of Israel s pronounces this blessing. He, he repronounces this blessing over the people of Egypt as they come out. He who blesses you will be blessed and he who curses you will be cursed. And so Today, I want to kind of rhetorically just ask us, what was Israel's purpose in the earth? I realize that God chose Israel, and, we, and, and I was talking with a friend of mine yesterday about why did God choose Israel. He chose Israel because God loved Abraham supernaturally. God loved Abraham. God found in Abraham a man that was not ashamed to stand up for the principles, the morals of righteousness. Even though the Torah hadn't been written, God found the man in whom he could trust that man's heart to follow him and to be obedient to him. And God loved Abraham so much, he chose his seed. But 
what was the purpose in Israel's life? You, you know, part of this is maybe going to be a little subjective on my part, but, but you can pray about it and see what the Spirit of God says to you about it. Certainly, that the choosing of Israel and Israel being an instrument in God's hand, God wanted to bless the whole world through Israel. We, we read from, from Yochanan, Becky read out of the good news of Messiah, according to Yochanan, she read about, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves the world. God loves Abraham. God loves Isaac. God loved Jacob. And he loved Israel so much that he wanted Israel to be the people group that would bring the knowledge of God to the whole world. You go to some synagogues, and you see in a lot of synagogues, I know there's one over in the village area of Houston. Up on the wall, it says, a light of salvation to the nations, a light. God chose Israel, wanted Israel to be a light. But, but and I don't see how anybody... They could argue with this, but <laughs> I don't think the argument stands up. The ultimate way that God showed through Israel the light in, in, in the revelation of who he was to the nations was through the arm of his salvation, the Messiah, Yeshua. And we don't see that any more clearly than we do in the book of Isaiah. And before I put that up on the screen... This is, this is the way I learned this years and years ago. This is, it, it, a lot of people would argue this is Israel speaking. Israel is the servant he talks about. He's identified so in such and such a verse. But it's, when you listen to what this prophecy says, how can Israel draw Israel? You see what I mean? The, the prophecy says that this is in chapter 4. 49, I believe, it's verses 4 through 6 of Isaiah. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain, yet surely the justice of the Lord is due me and my strength with my God. And now, says the Lord, who formed me in his womb to bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the nations. And, and I, I want you to see that in, in the... Uh, in the Tree of Life Bible too. But I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and futility. Yet surely the justice due to me is with Adonai and my reward with my God. And now says Adonai who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, to gather Israel back to him. For I am honored in the eyes of Adonai and my God has become my strength. So he says, it's too trifling, it's too small a matter, it's too little a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. And that's what I was talking about a minute ago. How, how can this servant being talked about in this passage be Israel when it says this servant's going to be raised up to, to, to bring back the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel? He says, so I will give you, whoever this servant is, as a light for the nations that you should be my salvation. You know what the Hebrew word there is? Yeshua, so that you could be my Yeshua to the end of the earth. You could be my salvation to the end of the earth. This is a potent scripture from the word of the Lord. It, it, it is like the ultimate fulfillment of God's revelation to the world of how much he loved the world would be when they saw the arm of his salvation, the servant of God who would be not just, in fact, we have it on the, the doors of this, oh, above the doors of our synagogue when you come in. It says, Ha'or le'ha'ir le'goyim ve'tifer Yisrael amecha, a light of revelation to the Gentile nations and the glory of my people Israel. It's written over the door of this synagogue because Yeshua is the ultimate, ultimate showing and revelation of God to the whole world. And, and so we're thinking about Israel's place in, in God's plan. But people, today... I want to just downshift a little bit. We're going to kind of zoom out today, and that's what we've already done. We've gone into the scriptures, but we've zoomed out and we've looked at Israel 
kind of as an overview of how God might have seen Israel and what God desired for Israel to do to get the light of his revelation out to the Gentile nations. But the ultimate sign of that, and we talked about it, it was Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. And so I want to talk about what is God's purpose for America today? If God has a purpose for nations and God's purpose for Israel was to know him and love him and walk with him and to reveal him to the rest of the world and to be a light, then, then what's Israel, what's, excuse me, what's God's purpose for America? And people, <laughs> I just want to say publicly, I love this nation. I'm so thankful to God for America you know, this is subjective on my part. I realize that. I'm not standing here. I, maybe I should step away a little from the podium. And, and I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord God. These are the two purposes. For I'm not saying that. This is, this is my opinion of why God raised up America for such a time as this. He raised up America, number one, to be a fulfillment of that prophet prophecy through Isaiah that Yeshua, it, people would have freedom to worship as they willed and that, that Yeshua's name could be honored amongst a people, not forced on them, but honored amongst a people that the name of Yeshua, there's, there's no other nation on the earth where the name of Yeshua has been magnified more and preached more and, and prophesied more from than America and gone out to the nations of the earth. That, that's, that's my opinion that that's one of the reasons God raised America up for this time. The second reason I really believe with all my heart was to make sure that the restoration of Israel and the Jewish people would be fulfilled on the earth as he promised through the prophets. And we have two people groups today. One of them are Jewish people saying, I'm not sure about Yeshua being the light to all the Gentile nations. I'm not sure that he's my, our Messiah. And we have another people group, the body of Messiah, the church, who says, I'm not sure about Israel being a nation and a people before God. Listen to both people groups today. I'm saying, would you just ask God? Don't ask me. Ask God about it. Is that possible that all the prophecies contained in Scripture about Israel being blessed and being a nation forever before the eyes of the Lord and being the ones in the land to, say, to be ready to say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai to Yeshua when he comes back. Is it possible that, that the body of Messiah might see that Israel is that chosen instrument and that Israel might see Yeshua is the arm, the Zeroah, the arm of God to bring salvation to the whole world? Listen, we, do we have problems in America? <laughs> uh, there are not enough people in here to go, yes! But we have problems in America. But, but beloved, listen to me today. I went back and did a little history research and started reading about the American Revolution. And if you think the nation of America just formed out of a group of men and women who, who wanted freedom and came up with, a, with an idea. Everybody was in agreement on all the ideas of what would happen in America. That's, that's not true. Go read about the... I, what I went to look for was just one guy. I wanted to look up. I thought uh, Patrick Henry was, was the one, if, if you remember, his famous saying. He was an eloquent speaker. He didn't write much, so we don't know a lot about his life like we do Thomas Jefferson because Jefferson wrote a lot. But, but Patrick Henry was the one that said, give me liberty or give me death. That... that you know, the whole point of the American Revolution was, and I think we can sum it up in a, in a little phrase that came out of the Boston Tea Party. You remember the Boston Tea Party where they threw the tea? The tea had come over from England, and as they sold it to the colonists, they would tax them pretty heavily on that tea, and the colonists said, you know what? 
you're taxing us, but we have no voice in what happens in our land here. You're telling us what to do. We're paying you taxes, but we have no voice. N no taxation without representation. N that was their saying. That was their slogan. No taxation without representation. And that really was the essence of the whole thing. Great Britain was going to rule over America, but not give America any right to govern itself in any sense of the stretch of the imagination. And so, listen, you go read the stories of those men. By the way, Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> they almost didn't speak to each other for many years because Hen Patrick Henry had certain ideas about what the republic or the democracy should look like, and Jefferson had some other ideas, and they argued, and they weren't the only ones that had. These men, these early founders, they wrestled with themselves. Go back and read it. Once I got to this guy, and then I read about Jefferson, and then I got to that guy and another guy, and I was just reading about, it was about two or three hours one afternoon just reading about these men, and, and it wasn't a... a kumbaya moment when they put America together. They were wrestling. Should we do this? What do we do? What are, listen, listen. This is a great point I want you to hear today. America. I would that all America was listening to this. You know, when we broke away from Great Britain, and John mentioned it earlier, when we broke away from Great Britain, we had independence. Everybody can say independence. independence. Listen, Independence means, you know what? We're, we're away from you now. You're not going to tell us what to do. We're going to become our own nation. We're going to have independence from your rule. And, and I have a friend of mine, a close friend of mine that's never met me. And his name is Oswald. His first name is Oswald. And Oswald has something to say about this. And I want you to listen to this. I'm going to try to do this slowly. If I have to go read it, if, if I can't remember all of it, I'll go back and read it. But Oswald is trying to say there's a difference between uh, independence on one hand and liberty on the other hand. Now, I know if you go look them up in the dictionary, they kind of, they're synonyms sort of. But, but listen to what Oswald says because the Word of God backs him up with, with the essence of what he's trying to say, that independence is not the same as liberty. And here's what he says. We call liberty allowing the other fellow to please himself as much as we please ourselves. True liberty is the ability earned by practice to do the right thing. There's no such thing as a gift of freedom. Freedom must be earned. The counterfeit of freedom is independence. When the Spirit of God deals with sin, it's independence that he touches. That's why the preaching of the gospel creates resentment as well as craving. Independence has to be blasted right out of a believer's life. There must only be liberty, and that's a far different thing. Liberty, listen to Oswald over a hundred years ago. Spiritually speaking, liberty is the ability, gives you the ability to fulfill the Torah, and it establishes the rights of others. Spiritually speaking, liberty is the ability to fulfill the Torah, and it establishes the rights of others. You say, well, you said that's scriptural. How, how is it scriptural? Listen, Rabbi Paul Shaul of Tarsus, after he became a believer and wrote over half the New Covenant books, in one of them, he's writing to a group at Galatia. And he says that, that we have been called, now listen to this, this is Shaul, we have been called unto liberty. This is in the, I believe, the fourth or fifth chapter of Galatians. We have been called unto liberty, only do not use liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. <clears throat> if America could get hold of this truth today, we have been called unto liberty, only do not use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. People, listen, and I'll tell you, I'll give you the exact reference. I believe I wrote it down, Galatians 5, 13. For you have been called unto liberty, only do not use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. What you see going on 
out in America today. Listen, do we believe there are some bad apples in our law system? Of course, listen, there are bad apples not just in law, but there are bad apples everywhere. There are bad apples in government. There are bad apples in your congregations. There are bad apples somewhere. Some people just don't want to be regenerated. Some people do not want to commit their will to God. And when somebody, we read about it, Becky read about it in the New Covenant, if you, if you don't come and yield yourself to the light, some people hate the light. They're not going to come to the light because their deeds are evil and they don't want them reproved. They, want, they don't want them known, so they're just going to fight against it. But if you come to the light, if you want to do the truth, you don't know how many times I've prayed this over the Jewish community and the non-Jewish community of Houston. For he that wants to do truth will come to the light that his deeds could be made manifest that they are wrought in God. That, that people who have a heart to do right will come to the light of Messiah who died for their sins and who wants to live his life in them. They will come to the light if they want to do the truth. You got people out there all over the place, not, a, not me, listen, 99% of, of our police departments and sheriff department and fire department, 99 of our percent of our people are good people. They're trying to do what's right. Yes, let's get the bad seat out, but I am tired of seeing fire set and businesses burn. I'm tired of it. Listen to me. America is still one of the greatest nations. It is the greatest nation that it, that's ever been raised up. And you know why it is? This is very important. When I went back and studied the history, you know what I saw? America is great because of the ideals it set up as, as a goal, as a mark. Were they perfect men? No, they were not perfect. Did some of them have slaves? Yes, some of them had slaves. And, and they were troubled about it, and they argued about it. And, and, but they put down things in writing and set a goal for this nation of things that we want to live up to, a standard that we want to live up to. They weren't just independent from Britain. Freedom, with freedom comes responsibility. And they, they made laws that would allow people to have the freedom to choose to worship the way they wanted to worship. They created laws. In fact, listen, <laughs> they, they set a standard. And, and I, as I was growing up, this was fascinating as I looked at this, as I was growing up, I remember going to school. Every day at school, we would cite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the republic to which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm like, I think I, think I put it up there. And, and so if, if they can show that to our people at home, and, and everybody, if you just repeat it with me, I, I'm not going to have you stand up now, but... Just say it with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And, and you know, I should have been facing this way to the flag when I said it. Listen, I want you to look at that and just think about it for a minute. This is the, this is the standard that our fathers set for America. And, and no, this wasn't written in 1776. This was written during the Civil War when our nation was being ripped apart. And I can't even remember the man's name that first wrote it. This, this is not the final form. He wrote the guts of it, but they added a couple of things. They changed a couple over time. In fact, it was, I was eight years old when they added under God in 1954. I just told you my age, and you're thinking, he doesn't look that. Well, listen, it, listen, one nation under God, indivisible. When that man wrote indivisible, they were fighting the Civil War, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, liberty and justice for all. That was the standard they set in this nation. Did they always attain to the standard? 
No. Do you always attain to the standard that you set for your life? That's why Yeshua came, because none of us have attained to the standard that we set for our life. We know, we know what the Word of God says, but we have not attained to that standard. That's why Yeshua came and died and shed his blood for our iniquities and transgressions. And, and once we repented for our sins and asked him, and he comes in and sets us free and and begins to write the Torah on our hearts and in our minds. And, and it's like Oswald says, liberty helps give us the ability to fulfill the Torah. And it establishes the rights of others. And that's what Galatians is talking about. You've been called unto liberty, only don't use liberty for an occasion of the flesh. Everybody that's listening to me, think about this. Most people on the earth still want to come to America. With all of our troubles, we're the number one place where everybody wants to come and get a citizenship in America. That was so refreshing. I called for permission with Elena and Jorge Tokaru. I called and asked permission because a couple of weeks ago when they were here and they read from the Torah and the New Covenant, they shared with everybody back in March, they got citizenship to America. Listen to me. You know how long they've been in America? 20 years nearly. 20 years and they just got citizenship in March. You know how much money they've spent over the years trying to stay here and trying to get fellowship, I mean citizenship? About $20,000. About $20,000 in 20 years trying to get citizenship to this country. If we're so bad like some people in this nation are saying we're bad, if we're so bad, why is everybody still wanting to come here? It's still because of the ideals that our fathers, the, the ideals that they set, the goal, the standards that they set, that we would be one nation under God, invisible with liberty and justice for all. They still want to come here. When, when Jorge and Elena were sworn in, and, and this is very, very important. She shared this with me this week. When they were sworn in, you know what they had to do? They had to renounce their citizenship in Venezuela and they had to say the pledge to the flag of the United States of America and there were in Houston this just was one week there were 3,000 people there from 127 different countries on the day that they got and that was just in Houston they have other places and I when I'm when I'm listening to her talk about this I'm getting so stirred up because I wanted to talk about God's purpose for Israel and God's confirmation of Yeshua being the Messiah coming out of America and being preached all over the world that Yeshua is the light of salvation that America is a chosen instrument of God as well to to build Israel back up as a nation who's who's the only nation at some some points who stands with the nation of Israel and the UN the, listen thank God for America standing with Israel yes I know there are a lot of people out there this is going to upset them but I'm not worried about that I'm worried about upsetting God God's the one that raised up Israel God's the one that said he's the one that promised through the prophets I'm going to bring them back to the land that I gave them and, and I'm going to establish my word in them and my salvation in them. And so I, I was thinking, listen, Beth Messiah, you know, every week as I was thinking about the value of citizenship and every week we say something and I thought, <laughs> I thought, you know what? In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, and you can follow along with me. This is in the second chapter of Ephesians, and I had them put this up for me on the screen. I wanted you to see this. This is, this is Shaul of Tarsus, Rabbi Paul, writing to the congregation, that Galatia earlier. This is the congregation at Ephesus. And, and Paul is saying to them, 
And he's talking mostly, it's a mostly Gentile congregation. Here's this Jewish apostle that's met the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. And most of the Jewish apostles stayed in and around Israel. But Paul went out to the nations. He was called of God to take the good news of the Jewish Messiah out to the nations, the Gentiles. And, and before we read through this, you have to understand, Shaul is overcome with the revelation that God has given him. Not just of Yeshua. Yes, that changed Shaul's whole life. Go read about it in Acts chapter 9 when God knocked him to his feet and the arm of God Yeshua said, why are you persecuting me, Paul? Go read about his testimony. But he's overcome with something almost as great what, what happened when Yeshua came. Shaul is overcome by the fact that he was going to bring the Jew and the Gentile together, which Paul thought could never happen. And back then, if you'd lived in the time, if you'd lived in the land, if you'd lived in the Mediterranean Sea area, you would understand why Paul was blown away that this could happen. It was the same way that Peter was blown away at Cornelius' household when God opened up the good news of the Jewish Messiah to the Gentiles. What? They were, they didn't eat with Gentiles. They, uh, listen to what Paul says about this. He's fascinated by what God has done. Therefore, keep in mind that once you, Gentiles in the flesh, were called uncircumcision by those called circumcision, which is performed on the flesh by hand. At that time, you were separate from Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our shalom, the one who made the two, Jew and Gentile, into one and broke down the middle wall of separation. Within his flesh he made powerless the hostility, the law code of mitzvot contained in regulations. He did this in order to create within himself one new man from the two groups, making shalom, and to reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. And he came and proclaimed shalom to you who were far away and shalom to those who were near. He's, you hear what he's saying? And he, and he came to preach shalom to the Gentiles who were far away and had no understanding of the Jewish God and the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had no understanding of him. And, and he's saying he brought you from far away and shalom to those, the Jewish people who were very near, both of them together in the Messiah. For through him, we both have access to the Father by the same Ruach, the same Spirit. So then, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. We should just pause there. So then, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow what? Citizens. citizens. Listen, there's a better citizenship than the one in America, and it's only that one that's better because it's part of the family of God. You've been called to a citizenship of the believers. You're fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. You have been built on the foundation made up of the apostles and the prophets with Messiah Yeshua himself being the, chief, the cornerstone. And him, the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple for the Lord. In him, you also are built together into God's dwelling place in the Ruach. This, this is so important, people. Shaul got hold of this. Was he saying that the church has replaced Israel? No. Paul still lived like a Jew. He still followed the Torah. The Torah was being rewritten on his heart, and he already had it written in his mind. The Spirit of God came in and rewrote the Torah on his heart. He walked with the Torah. He followed the Torah, but he wasn't set free by the Torah. He was set free by the blood of Yeshua. He wasn't justified by doing the works of the Torah. He was made free and justified by the blood of Yeshua. And he got this, but he was 
completely overwhelmed that God, through the Jewish Messiah, was trying to bring the Gentiles and the Jews together to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was a fascinating thing. And every week, we we stand up and we say this, and <laughs> I want you to stand up with me. You don't realize this, but this is kind of like a pledge of allegiance, not to the flag of America, which is awesome, but this is like, we don't really, we do it, you know what we do this like? We do it like I was a little boy in school doing the Pledge of Allegiance. I said it every morning. I said it every morning. I didn't know what I was saying. How many of you said the Pledge of Allegiance in your classes at morning? You at home, raise your hand. I can't see you. And so you, you're, you're like, it became so mundane that you didn't understand what you were saying. Every Shabbat we read this. But this is kind of like a Pledge of Allegiance. Say it with me. There is no God like you, O Lord, and there are no deeds like yours. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. I don't deny you are king, you have always been king, and you shall be the king forever and ever. Give strength to your people. Lord, bless your people with the peace that transcends human understanding. Let the words of Messiah Yeshua be greatly honored in Israel and throughout the earth. Father of compassion, do good with Zion according to your will. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, for we trust in you alone. O King, Lord, exalted and uplifted creator of the universe. That's kind of like a pledge of allegiance to the king and the kingdom of God. We ought to realize that instead of just making it a mundane thing we do once a week. Yes, we're going to say it again. It's like doing the pledge of allegiance. If I, if I had it, I, if, I don't know how fast I could get to the pledge of allegiance, but I'd really like to, uh, while we're standing, I'm going to see if I can go back. I don't know how to do this. Tell me when I get there. The pledge of allegiance. Okay. All right, and now we're gonna. We're, if you're here in the sanctuary, we're gonna face the flag, and and I would invite you if you're at home watching this. Yeah, that's great, brother. That's really good. Rabbi Phillips got a tremendous idea. He's gonna bring the flag of America up on the bema because we recognize today that that God's call. He's honored us by letting some of us be born here, by some of us coming and becoming citizens. He's honored us as citizens of the United States. So if you just put your hand over your heart with me and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Father, Thank you. For, thank you, Philip. You can take that away because I want to make one more plea to everybody watching. Listen, you know, the Jewish saying is, have I got a deal for you? You that are watching at home, have I got a deal for you? I have a citizenship to the best kingdom that there ever will be, and you don't have to wait 20 years and you don't have to give $20,000 in one moment of repentance. Genuine repentance. Saying, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I realize your son, the arm of your salvation, he bled and he bought my salvation and I've squandered it or I have even exercised any faith to believe it. In one moment, you can have genuine repentance before God, and you can become a citizen yeah. of, of the kingdom of God. Yeah. If you will invite the king and his rule into your heart through repentance. People, I don't care if you're Jew or Gentile or black or white or brown or male or female, American citizen, South American. It, listen to me. In one moment, if you genuinely repent, I promise you with all of heaven backing me, with all the word of God backing me, I promise you Yeshua will invade your life if you want him, if you want to do the truth, you want to come to the light of the truth so that your deeds could be made manifest that they're wrought in God. 
I, I invite you today in to citizenship, full citizenship. You, you can be Jewish or Gentile. There are no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God, none. Would you pray with me, Father, in the name of Yeshua? I ask you to forgive me for my sins and my transgressions, and I ask you, Lord God, to put the blood atonement over the doorpost of my heart and my life, and I, I'm inviting the king and his kingdom to invade my heart. I need help. I need help. I need your presence. I've got things I just can't handle. God, please come and help me. I'll, I'll give my life to you. I'm sorry for everything I've done that's broken your heart. I don't want to be another tear in your eye. Uh, God, I want to be, if I'm a tear in your eye, I want it to be a tear of joy today. I want all the angels of heaven rejoicing over one that's, that's what you promised, over one sinner that repents, all the angels would rejoice. So come into my life and bring your kingdom and bring all that it entails. Bring your presence, oh God, in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen and amen. And Father, we at the congregation, we just pray for everybody that was watching online today. Lord, we are grateful that we live in America we're thankful. We're honored. We pray. We pray for those people that are so angry and burning and tearing down and trying to tear the history of this nation away. Lord, it's an imperfect history because it's made up of imperfect people. It was founded by imperfect people, but it was founded with principles that are right and true. And though it didn't always show up in their lives and it doesn't always show up in our lives, we're like shot little of Tarsus. We say we count not ourselves to have apprehended, but one thing we do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before we press toward the mark for the prize of your high calling and the Messiah. And Lord, we pray for anybody today that might have prayed that prayer, Abba, <laughs> do what you do. Let your specialty be made known. Invade their hearts with the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen.